We are building a very integrated talent strategy, and what that means is we want it to be kind of easy for people to figure out what we're about as an employer. So we are introducing like common language into the thing. Anytime we talk about an employee, whether it's somebody that we're going to hire or somebody that we're going to put through a training class or somebody that we're sending for a special developmental project, somebody that's going to get an, uh, some on-the-job training and a, make a lateral move somewhere, we're trying to use the same language all the time and really have people understand that it's all linked together. Um, and I think that it's working to our advantage. Um, people are extremely open at Big Y and really excited about any new tools or ways to do things easier, faster, better, differently that you get good results from. So we've been really just dipping our toe in the water for the last two or three months and I think we're ready to, um, to really bring some excitement to the whole employee employment process. Um, I will tell you I do believe that not just HR leaders but hiring managers at any level um, Michelle, you know, in your stores, your department managers, yourself, people are more sophisticated about bringing in talent than they were five to ten years ago. Technology has given us a huge leg up and has given us ways to have a lot more information about people than we would have had five years ago even. Um, the social networking is another way that employers are getting a lot of information about people, some of it maybe not so good. Um, I know as my sons were, you know, my youngest one especially, posting on Facebook and all that, you try and you know, tell them that someday some employer might be browsing your Facebook pictures and you perhaps might want, not want that particular picture <laughs> up there. Um, but it's very true, we don't do that at Big Y, but there are companies that do look at people's Facebook page. Uh, there was a lawsuit in Connecticut only about three months ago maybe that was about that exact thing. Um, we do use technology. We use it heavily. We use it for every hire in the store. We use it for every hire in the support centers. Um, we use a, a lot of assessments. So before we bring anyone on board, um, even a cashier, we have some form of an assessment that we do that we hope is going to tell us whether or not this person not only has the capability to perform the particular job, but we're really at that point we're much more interested in do they have the, the, the fit? The, the, you know, will they be, be a good fit for the big Y culture? Um, and that's a big, big advantage to have now that you know, hiring managers didn't have um, not terribly long ago. We use a lot of tools. We use something called competency modeling. Uh, we use a lot of science. We're not doing the science ourselves. There are other people, thank God, that have done that for us. But we are using some really scientifically based tools and we spend a lot of time, I think we spend, and I think most employers do, spend more time now um, making decisions about bringing someone into their organization than they ever did in the past. And it's for a lot of reasons, but I really do feel, um, and I know that we do, we really take our time to make sure we're making the best possible choice for the organization. And I, I call the things at the bottom what it used to be when, way back when I was in the, the retail food industry back in Buffalo, you know, we, we would, they would do what they called the finger of God. I like you. <laughs> and that was the finger of God. And I like you because of your reflection in the mirror. And why do I like you? Because you look like me. So I'm all good with that. And, you know, that is still the most prevalent way most people, you know, in their subconscious want to hire. They want to hire somebody that they immediately connect with, that thinks like they do, that looks like they do, that, you know, has similar background to theirs. And um, thank goodness with all these other tools, you're able to look at lots and lots and lots of facets of an individual, and many, many times you find yourself making a different decision than the one you absolutely, I know who I'm gonna hire for this job, and by the time you interview and use some of these tools, you end up making a completely different decision, and it's usually a better decision. So we're, we're big fans of um, all the tools we can get to help us and our hiring managers with our jobs. So what does this mean to you? I'm doing my first official time check. Okay, I think I'm good. Um, you know, anyone who has looked for a job recently or maybe about to look for a job, there are so many things to think about now when you're in the market. Um, and one of the things that I think about is the whole process and why has it evolved so much? What's been going on that has made employers be more selective? And the tools that I'm talking about that we use, those are not inexpensive. So those are tools that employers are making a really significant investment in for the sole purpose of getting the right talent into their companies. So it's really interesting. Um, so what does it mean for people seeking a new position and how do you improve your chances of being selected? And I don't, really don't have any magic bullets, 
I, I think that just kind of knowing maybe what goes on in the background is sometimes helpful. I would tell you that I don't think we are unique in any way. I think most companies, and I'm sure if I ask for a show of hands, how many of you in this room do your companies use assessments when they hire people? It would probably be a pretty significant amount of folks. Or how many use uh, you know, structured interviewing? Or how many use whatever kinds of things you might think of? Um, I can tell you one of the reasons I believe it has changed so much is because people have really figured out that it is a super costly guess if you just try and hire someone based on particularly resumes and interviews. Because I'm sure you've met them, I have met them. Um, there are some people who interview beautifully. You would swear that they would come in and be the perfect person for the job. And you don't have any factual data, you just have your impressions and the other people who may have joined in the interview process. And sometimes it's not what you see is what you get. It can be quite the opposite. So I think as, um, as CEOs and leaders, line leaders, anybody hiring somebody has realized that it costs a lot of money to bring the wrong person into your company. And that you really ought to put the same attention on selecting your people as you do selecting whatever your business does. For us, it's products and it's how do we price our products. Um, and we want to be as good at picking people as we are at picking those other things. And I think what that means from a candidate standpoint, and it's really funny having recently been a candidate myself, um, it, was a, it was an interesting perspective for me, knowing what I now know, um, to be on the other side of the table. Because I really had to think about how I wanted to approach my own search. Um, and I think it really means you kind of have to be a student of the company that you want to work for and or the position you want to have. Because I know in every interview that I do, when I ask people if they have any questions and they don't have any, I'm really disappointed. I really want people to know enough about the company to frame up one or two questions, even if it's something that's already been covered in the interview. You can always say, well, I think you, you touched on this earlier, but I'd really like to ask about whatever it might be. You know, who's your biggest competitor or what's your, uh, you know, what are, what are the goals of the company for the next three years? Whatever it might be. You know, we have the internet, we have social media, we have networking. Um, lots of ways to find things out about a company and I really, really think that's important. Um, you kind of have to be a researcher about the company. You have to be really savvy about asking some of those questions. And you also have to not be shy. You kind of have to market yourself and tell the interviewer why you would be such a perfect choice for them. Um, hot commodities. Janet asked me to talk about what do we really talk about behind the scenes? What do we look for? And honestly, we don't spend a whole lot of time talking about someone's specific skills for a job. Um, th those are kind of the ante. They kind of get you into the game. We spend a lot of time talking about flexibility. And actually, this I just read something a couple weeks ago that this is the number one competency or whatever you want to call it that employers look for when they're hiring somebody now because so much has changed and is going to continue to change. Um, you know, can you bob and weave? How good, how do you really personally deal with change? How well do you do that? And can you lead others through change? Because again, if I ask for a show of hands, I'm guessing that there probably would be lots of people in this room whose companies are going through some kind of change or another, whatever that might be. You know, how's your savvy? Whether it's organizational, political, interpersonal, you know, how, how, how well do you kind of work your way through the mazes that we all have to work our way through? And then we talk about something that we call the big eight. How well do you score on the big eight? And the big eight are simply competencies that really correlate across any level of, of perform, any level job. They correlate to high performance and they're really hard to find. They're not in high supply. So the things that are up here on the screen are a lot of things that you'll find we'll build really probing questions around in our interview process. And again, Lindsay, who quoted me the numbers earlier on the, the uh, monster versus LinkedIn, um, is really now uh, teaching all of our hiring managers how to do excellent interviews, seeking specific information about some of these hard to find but really, really important competencies. Um, and they're loving it because we kind of agree on what the competency, we don't kind of agree, we absolutely agree on what the competencies are for a specific job. Then we build, as I said earlier, that same language kind of thing, we build everything around that. So you're going to hear it in the interview, you're going to hear it as you walk through the company, you're going to see it on the paperwork we give you. Um, and it just really helps us kind of laser in. And we might have some jobs where some of these are really not as important, but some of them are always important. 
especially in a management or a leadership role. And so we've been really having a lot of fun um, at Big Y building some of these new models and uh, getting our, uh, our operate, we, just, we did a, a competency definition sort of week or two ago for the store director position, which is the most important job in our company. And um, we had Michelle there and several of her peers and we had our head of operations, we had our uh, head of merchandising and you know we spent three hours going through this process and it was so interesting to get everybody in the room kind of focused on that and really um, by the end of the three hours really in agreement about what those top you know 12 to 15 things are that really set apart a great store director from just a good store director so it's really fun to get you know when you can get your operations people to sit still for three hours and talk about competencies it's really fun and it's, it's something they don't spend time on so they were, I think, really proud of themselves as well, right, Michelle? <laughs> Very much so, and we had a ball with it. Um, probably the most important thing that we talk about in high performance is something called learning agility. We want it, everybody wants it. Learning agility means I can hire you for one thing, but I'm gonna be very confident that I could then put you somewhere else in my organization and you would continue to perform very well. Even if it was a field that you knew nothing about, you know, ab you know not a clue. And it, it really is, it's probably the hottest commodity. And we, again, we interview for it, we select for it. Um, you know, we look at people who we think have it and we try and give them assignments that will develop that ability. And it, it takes people out of their comfort zone all the time. Um, but it's really fun. You know, it, it really broadens them. And, and, you know, I experienced it in my own career going in and out of HR and operations. I know. Michelle's experience, most everyone I think has, you know, at some point, it's rare now to start your career doing one particular thing and staying, you know, kind of straight up that silo the whole time that you have that kind of career. And you really want to encourage people to move around in your organization and try different things. They might discover something that they didn't even know they were good at that they might be really, really, really good at. So that's something we look out, we look for a lot and we really want people, if they have it, to really leverage it. Um, and if you're looking for a job, you want to talk about different kinds of experiences you've had. Even if it has nothing to do with the job you're interviewing for, it demonstrates the fact that you've been able to be successful in first-time situations, in different kinds of situations, in situations that maybe are, as I said, outside your comfort zone, et cetera. And as an organization, we take those people and that's who we will disproportionately invest our money in. We'll spend more on developing them, we'll spend more time with them, they will get more promotions, you know, all the good things that you really want to have happen once you've made that decision. And they really typically um, will turn out to be your next generation leaders, and I'm sure we have many of them in the room. Um, some of the, the women who just graduated from their program, I think that's uh, just an awesome thing. You're at a wonderful point, and I think you can, um, you will be these people who get the disproportionate investment of time and money and development, and it's a really fun place to be. Um, I think that's the end, except for my closing. This is one of my very favorite movie scenes, and I like it because of what it says. And I, I didn't say who this was. I'll, I'll see how, how many movie buffs we have in here. But I have a wise man talking to a young man, and the wise man says, you must unlearn what you have learned. The young man says, all right, I'll try. No, try not. Do or do not. There is no try. I can't. Watch me, young man. I don't believe it. Wise man, that is why you fail. And I think that's been inspirational to me. Um, I, it's, anybody know what movie it is? I know Janet does. It's Yoda and Luke Skywalker. Exactly. It's Yoda and Luke Skywalker in The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> Very deep, very profound, <laughs> but it's one of my, and I, I, you know, no pride of ownership here. I stole it from a seminar that I went to years ago, um, and I just thought, oh my God, that stuck with me so much because we do have to unlearn so much in order to relearn and do things differently, and it's not very easy sometimes, but I love the last line, I don't believe it, and that is why you fail. So that's all I have. That kind of takes me back to my try a lot of stuff and have fun with it. <laughs>